gehen und ja. Du bist ein großer Versager. Ich? Du hast doch nichts gelernt. Ich höre sie reden von Zasta und Taler. Sie sind das Gift, das man erbt. Das Gift eben jener, die ihren Körper schinden und quälen, bis es nicht mehr geht. Oder das Gift der Eltern an ihr Kind, damit es sich erlebt. Hey yo, what's good my friends, welcome back to my channel, my name is Kojak, I'm a German rapper and today we're going on something different from India, it's not music this time, no it's geography now and a couple of you might know what this video, uh, video type is about, it's from the channel, geography now of course, and they tell them the, the stuff about the country that is most important basically, India is such a huge country and there's so much to tell about they put it in 19 minutes and i already saw he said like wow i had to condense this video much as much as possible missed out on mentioning so many things and it still came out to nearly 20 minutes long india is that complex and that what i was thinking about as well how do you put like india into a 20 minute video there's so much about this country that I can guess, I have almost no clue about India. I know it's the second biggest country uh, regarding to the population. Um, we had, I know a couple of things about Punjab because of the Sidamuzukhala reactions. And capital is New Delhi. Uh, I've, I've got many Krishna reactions on the channel. There's where it probably stops. Like, uh, I don't know that really much about India. So we're gonna take a look at this video and it will be very informative for me. That's really interesting. I want you guys to sub to the channel and hit the bell if you want to see more reactions like this. And please recommend me songs on my socials and Facebook or other videos regarding India. Maybe other countries as well, but especially India on in this case. Because, I mean, we are, we are on India right now. Please do that. Hit me up. And we're gonna take a look at the video because... Hold on, it's so long, man. This reaction is gonna be long. This reaction is gonna be long, eh? So, we have finally encroached upon the giant India. The giant! So, have been waiting a long time for this episode. Hold on. I'm just gonna say straight up. You all know India is incredibly complex yes. and diverse. Even Indians have trouble understanding their own country. <laughs> Obviously, I won't be able to scratch even the surface in this episode, but I'll try my best. A lot of you Indian geography peeps have helped me along the way, so thank you. And without further ado, let's begin. And this intro, this intro summed it up already. It's impossible to put it in 20 minutes, man. It's time to learn geography. Now! Hey everybody, I'm your host Barbie. This place doesn't even need much of an introduction. Everybody has heard of India. It's big, it's loud, it's colorful, and most importantly, it has a plethora of confusing territorial anomalies that I just can't wait to cover. Here we go. Oh. Political geography. Anomalies. He's talking about anomalies like the one thing I know is about Pakistan and uh, about Bangladesh because there were there were uh, earlier parts of India and now they're not anymore. Basically, that are the and I think uh, before Pakistan and Bangladesh were one country, I think. We, we will see, but this, there's, there was something about Hinduism and uh, Islam and this. Okay, let's see. There's an old saying, India is a place where everyone is in a hurry, but no one is ever on time. First of all, India is located in South Asia, right on the Indian and Arabian Seas and the Bay of Bengal, yes, bordered by sir. six other countries. So close to seven, but that land bridge between Sri Lanka got wiped away like 600 years ago by a cyclone. India's oh, wait, like really? Sri Lanka, Divided all right. Into 29 states and seven union territories with the capital New Delhi, which acts as its own administrative unit located in the capital territory. Keep in mind, New Delhi is actually just the name of one of the districts in the capital territory made up of 11. The largest city, however, is actually Mumbai. Oh, with... yeah, yeah. Mumbai, uh, I've heard about. And Mumbai was one of the fastest growing cities in the world. That is, that is I'm pretty sure about. Bangalore, I've heard about as well. New Delhi, Bangalore or Bengaluru, and Hyderabad following after. However, the four busiest airports are Delhi Indira Gandhi International, Mumbai's Chhatrapati Shivaji International, Bengaluru's Kempe Golda International, and Chennai International in the south. Ah, uh, you know- Chennai. Chennai I've not heard of. Oh, I am smiling. This is my favorite part of any episode we ever make. Territorial anomaly time. In hey man, ter territory anomaly is always very interesting because we get to know about history, how, how the country got like the borders and stuff like that that's always interesting yeah is loaded with strange borders and deliciously complex demarcation lines first of all what exactly is a union territory in the simplest way i can put this union territories are places that are too distinct to be incorporated into a state but too small to have their own local governments the first one of course is the delhi national capital territory where the capital lies chandigarh is a post-independent city constructed to replace lahore as the capital of the punjab area after it was split up between india and pakistan oh so so this is the first thing the first time he's talking about Punjab, Chandigarh, uh, the post-independent city constructed to replace Lahore. Lahore, I've heard. 
So Lahore was the capital before of Punjab area. After it was split up between India and Pakistan. All right. So when Pakistan became a country, Lahore was not the capital anymore. So Chandigarh was it then? All right. Constructed to replace Lahore as the capital of the Punjab area after it was split up between India and Pakistan. Then you have the island territories, the smallest one, Lakshadweep, and the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. The Andaman Islands being home to one of the last uncontacted people groups on the planet, the Sentinelese tribe, whom have been hostile to visitors and are therefore left alone. As oh, oh, oh. Okay. Well, the Nicobar Islands, which actually used to be a short-lived colony of Denmark. Finally, the three remaining territories are former European colony towns and ports. Dadra and Naga. Yeah, we know we know about coloni uh, colonization in India, Pakistan, and I mean in, in almost all Asia, right? Especially in the, in the sea area, there was so much colonization going on back in the days. Haveli, Daman and Diu, which are separated by about 200 kilometers across the Gulf of Kambat. And the most confusing Union territory, the French-speaking Puducherry, which is actually split up between four district cities across India. Karikal, Mah... There's a fr like French districts, like are there actually towns where, where French is like the main language because so many French... I call them invaders, got there back in the days and are still living in India. Okay, this is how I, how I think. Hey, Yanaon and Pondicherry. Pondicherry is strange because it has 11 enclaves within the Tamil Nadu state. Oh, and in this area, you can also find that experimental hippie-ish commune with a little bit of controversy. Look it up. Oh, and don't forget, here the... Okay, there's controversy about... Okay... <laughs> Okay, th there's some colonialism going on, all right. Eastern states, also known as the Seven Sisters, are connected by this incredibly narrow 27-kilometer-wide pathway known as the Siliguri Corridor. This pathway is like a crucial artery that completes the India puzzle. Or so you would think. Now let's discuss the juicy stuff. Now, in the China episode, I already talked about the disputed areas with India, such as Aksai Chin and Arunachal Pradesh, the latter pretty much just belonging to India as it's almost completely inhabited and operated by Indians. So let's move to the other disputes. Now, as of 2015, the Bangladesh episode is already outdated as India and Bangladesh have finally come to an agreement over the frighteningly complex former enclave exclave dispute. In the end, India only lost about 40 square kilometers of land to Bangladesh and now only a few enclaves and exclaves exist. Now let's head... Okay, so there was a dispute about a country if it belongs to Bangladesh or, or India and it turned out there was very just a small part of the country that moved over to Bangladesh. All right. North. Now, when you try to draw the shape of India, you might want to be careful which depiction you use. Some might use this picture, some might use this, some might use this, and those that don't really study very well might use this. The point is the whole- <laughs> Boy! <laughs> I use, why Italy, man? <laughs> the whole area is like the most heavily militarized, diplomatically stressed out region on the planet. It's already had like four wars in the past half century. Basically, India, Pakistan, and to some extent China all want the entire area for themselves, although it's more of like a Pakistan-India thing. In the China episode, we already discussed the Chinese disputes with India, so I won't cover those in this episode. If you want to learn more, just watch the China episode. But anyway, this entire area was a former domain known as the princely state of Jammu and Kashmir that was under royal Maharaja rulers all the way up until independence. Uh, uh, Kashmir? Kashmir uh, is in Pakistan, right? I, I think I, I remember Kashmir, all right. Known as the princely state of Jammu and Kashmir that was under royal Maharaja rulers all the way up until independence. Currently, this place is split up by this fenced off militarized line known as the line of control between India and Pakistan. Why is this? Well, in the quickest way I can put this, okay, the British are out, we get to take your land. Uh, no, we want to be an independent princely state. Uh, we're supposed to take your land and majority of your people are Muslim, just like us, even though your ruler is Hindu as well. Hey, India? Yeah? If you help me, I'll let you secede my territory to your land with autonomy. Deal. <laughs> ha! Your problem now! I love how Mike played India. He totally represents India. Oh, and keep in mind- uh, Okay, okay, okay. There's a territory between Pakistan and India they were fighting over. And this, uh, this territory wanted independence. And they were kind of asking India for help. So... <laughs> India was, okay, of course, India is the bigger country and has more military strength, so this is obvious. Pakistan's capital, Islamabad, is less than 80 kilometers away from all that drama. The line of control- Oh, Islamabad is so close. Control ...meanders through the mountains until it stops at a point called NJ9842. This is where things get really crazy, because from there you hit the Siachen Glacier, the second longest non-polar glacier in the world, and this is pretty much the dead man zone. After point NJ9842, you hit the actual ground position line, a series of military outposts that extend all the way to the Chinese border. That means everything in this area is ground zero for the Indo-Pak tension. And you know, the crazy thing is, there's actually 
actually literally small towns of normal regular civilians living in these areas high up in the mountains, many of which just go about daily life going to work and raising their families. Otherwise, they have a river dispute with Nepal and various river islands disputed with Bangladesh. Outside of all the dispute stuff though, India not only has the world's second largest road network and three of the world's top 10 mega cities and their own space program. Okay, real quick, I want to, I want to just capture real quick. So uh, there's issues with Pakistan, Nepal, and Bangladesh about territories. And now we're going on this really quick. Uh, three of the world's top 10 mega cities. We know Mumbai is one of them. I'm just guessing New Delhi is one of the other. And which is the third one actually? Hmm, that's interesting. Bangladesh. Outside of all the dispute stuff though, India not only has the world's second largest road network and three of the world's top 10 mega cities and their own space program, but they also have a copious abundance of landmarks and notable sites, way too many to list, but some of the ones that you guys, the Indian geography peeps have told me to mention include places like the abandoned Danush Kodi ghost city, Golconda Fort, the four pillars of Charminar, the Ajanta Buddhist art caves, the Alora monolithic ruins, Mandu fortress, the golden temple, which feeds over 100,000 We know the golden temple right here. The Golden Temple I've heard the before. The Monolithic Ruins, Mandu Fortress, the Golden Temple, which feeds over 100,000 people a day. The Gold Gumbaz This is... Yes, man. This is... This is kind of... Is there a social program, right? In the, with the, with this Golden Temple going on? Mausoleum, the Kalavantin Durg Post, the Ruins of Hampi, the Hill Forts of Rajasthan, Shaturunjaya Hill, which is basically like a Mecca for Jains, the Temple of the Bodhi Tree, Jal Mahal, Bangart Fort... Jal Mahal. Mumay, uh, what, one second. Jal Mahal? I'm pretty sure I know that and the most of these are actually like old architecture right so that's not really about the new stuff like I don't know skyscraper or anything this is all, all old stuff they built back in the days Rajasthan Shaturunjaya Hill which is basically like a mecca for Jains the temple of the Bodhi tree Jal Mahal Bangart Fort the most Jal Mahal uh, maybe I'm 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 mistaken it for something Taunted else. Haunted place in India, Mahabat Makbara. And keep in mind, just like in China, you can find a Great Wall of India in Rajsaman. There's also the Paritala Anjanea Temple with the largest statue in India depicting Hanuman. And at over 150 acres, the Sri Rangan Ataswami Temple, the largest. Oh, this this looks so incredible! Holy cow, this looks incredible. These architects were crazy. Largest Hindu temple in the world. The and, Hindu temple. And there's also that building with the stuff and the thing, whatever. Anyway, we could go on for centuries talking. So the most, he, he left out the most uh, famous uh, building and didn't say even the name, all right. About India's rich constructed domicile, but what it lies on top of is even more fascinating. <laughs> Now, don't make this mistake. I'm going to India. All I need are my sandals and sunscreen. Oh, crap. Now, as the seventh largest country in land area, India has a wide range of landscapes, climates, and elevations that all contrast from one corner to the other. First of all, let's talk about the north. India sits on the Indian tectonic plate that essentially smashed into the Eurasian plate, which in return created the largest mountain range in the world, the Himalayas. The force oh, is so yeah, strong yeah. that it's estimated that the Himalayas grow about 2.4 inches or 6.1 centimeters every year. There's also where you can find Kanchenjunga, the tallest mountain in India, or the third in the world, right on the border of Nepal. Keep your eye on these mountains. These are pretty much the source of most of India's major rivers that give life to the whole country that's why india takes okay that is interesting actually like the border to nepal there's the himalaya the the uh the mountains the big mountains and there's the source of the rivers and we actually talked in in cinemas of syl about like the rivers that flow right through punjab and that was that was a heavy issue i just remember because th there's some connection on this all right these mountains so seriously. You can also find the largest natural lake, Wular, up in the Jammu Kashmir area. Below the Himalayas, you reach the North Indian River Plains, sometimes referred to as the Indus Ganga. This is the most fertile part of India where the most important rivers like the Ganges and its tributaries flow. Heading a little south. Ga east, Ganges, we have heard. We, we met, hey, there's a well play even in German about the Ganges because Gang means like something like corridor in German. We say at the end of the, end of the, uh, Ganges, and that's at the end of the corridor. Hey, Amen. That's a stupid word play. Just saying. But we know about these, uh, about this river because of the most that. Fertile part of India, where the most important rivers like the Ganges and its tributaries flow. Heading a little south, you reach the Satpura and Vindhya ranges that pretty much divide North India from South India. On each side, you get the West and East Ghat Mountains, which in return creates this massive triangle thing called the Deccan Plateau. This place is moderately forested, especially in the east, in the Chotra Nagpur Plateau, where you get a section of the swampy Sundarbans that they share with Bangladesh. Check out the Bangladesh 
episode, head a little west and you get the dry tar desert along the border with Pakistan, as well as the run of Kutch known as the Salt Desert. And finally, the only active volcanic area would be the Adaman and Nicobar Islands, with Barren Island having actual conical eruptions and Bharatan having tame mud volcanoes. Now here's the thing, although India has a relatively high population density, they do relatively well with maintaining their ecological footing. In fact, in 2016, they beat a world record by planting, disputably, 50 million trees in one day. They've also agreed to reforest- What? What? 50 million in one day? Boy, we the world should the, the world should look on India as as a boy. This this is really good thing that they actually plant so many trees. A world record by planting disputably 50 million. But he said disputably, so they actually said about 50 million. So it's not like there's evidence for this this whole game okay. trees in one day they've also agreed to reforest about 12 percent of their country by 2030 the most heavily forested area being the seven sister states in east india now one of the factors that contributes to this would be the fact that india has the lowest meat consumption in the world with the highest population percentage of vegetarians at around 40 percent most this is because of uh, religion right this is because uh, in in hinduism you you uh, don't eat meat i think uh, but i we heard just um this is what we know in Germany about India that like the religion is changing kind of or the traditions especially in the big uh, cities that there are, there are less vegetarians each year in India and so uh, there's more meat necessary right to, to fill all the stomachs. But all right, we, we knew, actually I knew about that there's a lot of vegetarians in uh, India and that is good for the climate by the way, just saying man. Uh, even if it's a religious uh, reason. Meat consumption in the world with the highest population percentage of vegetarians at around 40%, most of whom are lacto-vegetarians that consume milk products. By the way, in India, when buying groceries, this label means vegetarian and this one means not vegetarian. Nonetheless, the remainder of the po oh, that's interesting. population does typically eat some kind of animal protein, mostly in the forms of seafood or chicken, but almost never beef or pork unless if you are part of the Muslim or Christian minorities scattered throughout the West and East areas. Beef and pork, I mean, you don't eat the pork as a Muslim and you don't eat beef as a Hindu, right? This is how far I would go, but okay. Now let's talk about the role of cattle, shall we? India has more cattle and livestock than anywhere else in the world at around 330 million. And it's interesting because since they have prevalent Hindu traditions, the killing of cows is illegal in many of the states except for a few, and each state has varying degrees of punishment for committing intentional cow slaughter. Keyword okay. intentional. Cows accidentally get hit by cars all the time. Once a cow is too old to produce milk, it typically is released into the open to die naturally in the wild, ideally. Nonetheless, male cattle get it much worse as they are deemed as kind of useless. Some places use them as draft animals for later some religious sects use them as sacrifices, but otherwise they are typically sold to the underground market for beef or hides. To this day, there are- Okay, okay, so... The religion prohibits to slaughter a cow, but they have to deal with it somehow because, of course, cows, like, eat really much. So they can't be fat, like, in a way. So we have to do something about the cows, man, to in this economy. Amen. All right. As sacrifices, but otherwise they're- By, by the way- um, I, I was for a long time not eating meat. Like right now I'm doing, but I think it's a good thing to not eat too much meat typically sold to the underground market for beef or hides. To this day, there are about six times as many female cows as male cattle in India. So that means, yeah, something's happening to the males. Nonetheless, India does have the third highest carbon emission rate after China and the US, fourth if you consider the EU. The, the how much third highest after? China and the US. But look, I mean, is that the highest carbon emission rate per person? Or in, at all, like on the whole population? Because of course China and India are the biggest countries. Of course they're, they're producing the most carbon emission. But why the US? You know what I'm saying? I mean, US, the USA is such a big producer of, of, of emissions. Not because the population is so high, just because, anyway, other reasons, other reasons. However, emission per capita, they rank pretty low at only about two kilotons per person. That's what I said. That's what I said. Contrast that with Qatar at about 40. There are 94 national parks, 501 animal sanctuaries across the country where you can find some of the national animals like the peacock, the Ganges River dolphin, the king cobra, the Indian elephant, and the highest population of Bengal tigers in the world, which are all highly protected. India. I mean, I loved all these animals they showed on screen, man. I'm, I'm an animal lover. It also has the most irrigated land in the world, which allows them to become the number one producer of multiple products 
products like millet, bananas, lemons, wait, limes. Wait, 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 not so fast, man. You are, you are exaggerating, which boy. Which allows them to become the number one producer of multiple products like millet. What, what is millet? Is that kind of a banana? Bananas, lemons, limes, mangoes, ginger, chickpeas, milk, butter, fennel, jute, and about 75% of the world's spices alone come from India. Spe I mean, I know fennel, I know I know most of the products, but not all of them, but that the spice production is like 75% from India, globally? That is heavy weighing. That is heavy weighing, man. All right. I mean, there's, there's a good reason that we're saying, like, the Indians cook the best food in the world, right? Boy, all right. Speaking of which, food! Typically you can find the staples roti, chapati, and naan in the north. Okay, we know naan, that is a bread. And dosa in the south, and everybody eats rice. The more commonly commercial- Rice, all right. Rice Indian foods that we in the west grew up knowing, like samosas, tikka masala. I, we know that, we know, yeah, I know all of them. <laughs> because we know them in the west, all right. My favorite Indian dish, palak paneer. These usually come from the northern regions of India. Mm, seriously, India, you took spinach and made it fat. I love you guys. Otherwise, the west- <laughs> They put butter in it, right? So, okay, okay, okay. I see what you did there. Spinach, hey amen. I like spinach, actually. I don't know this dish. Yeah. Mm, seriously, India, you took spinach and made it fat. I love you guys. Otherwise, the West is mostly known for their chutneys and pickled foods, as well as beef, since there's a high number of Muslims and Christians. The South uses a lot more coconut and has some of the best curries, like porial, sambras, rasams, and tutus. And the East is known for having the best desserts, like peda, mishti doi, rasgula, or shondesh. Speak Rasgula I've heard before, man. I'm pretty sure. Pretty sure. Which India is so diverse and complex that sometimes even Indian people need translators when going to different states. It's about to get 10 times more confusing in about 3, 2, 1. Demographics, here we go. Demographics is actually like population, right? Trashti Tudor once said, In India, we celebrate the commonality of major differences. We are a land of belonging rather than blood. First of all, India has a population of about 1.3 billion people and is the second most populous country in the world after China with about 18% of the world's population. About 72% of the country is Indo-Aryan and a quarter are Dravidian and the majority of the remainder are Mongoloid, Asian and other people groups. They also use... Okay, the okay, 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 okay. Let's go real quick back. Indo-Aryan, Dravid, Dravidian. I don't, I don't know what Dravidian is. I've never heard it. Crazy. Are Mongoloid, Asian, and other people groups. They also use the Indian rupee as their currency. They use the Type C, D, and M plug outlets, and they drive on the left side of the road. By the way, technically, it's illegal for these banknotes to leave the country, but you guys have sent me a lot of them for fan mail for Fan Friday videos, so I don't want to go to jail again. Now, keep in mind, those. <laughs> Wait, why is it illegal to to take like money from India out of the country? That is that is interesting. Okay. For fan mail for Fan Friday videos, so I don't want to go to jail again. Now keep in mind, those statistics that I just mentioned are incredibly generalized. Of the Indo-Aryan and Dravidian communities, there are about 2,000 different ethno-linguistic people groups in India, with about 645 district indigenous tribes, 52 major ones. So obviously. Wait, wait, wait. He was talking about the different languages and ethnicities, right? 2,000 ethno-linguistic groups. So we have like 2,000 different slangs uh, slash languages. Holy cow. This is the most diverse country I think is uh, existing in the groups world. In India with about 645 district indigenous tribes. tribes, 52 major ones. So obviously we can't cover them all, but what we do know is that the north is very different from the south. For one, the north mostly speaks in languages that are all related to the Indo-Aryan branch with languages like Hindi, Bengali, Punjabi, and Gujarati, whereas the south... Hindi, Bengali... Yeah, yeah, yeah. We know about that. We know Punjabi, we know Bengali, we know Hindi. That are actually the three... Three of the most spoken languages in the world. I think when you when you put like the top ten languages in the world, these three are within these languages. Gujarati, I don't know, and the southern will be interesting as well because I'm pretty sure I've not heard about them. Gujarati and Gujarati, whereas the South speaks a completely unintelligible Dravidian branch with languages like Tamil, Telugu, Malayalam, and Kannada. <laughs> Canada. Other <laughs> Canada. Uh, never heard about these languages. Plus, there's also pockets of Sino-Tibetan and Austro-Asiatic languages spoken in the far north and east. Wait, so how do they all, like, communicate with each other? Great question! Although India does not have an official language, there are 22 recognized national languages, and of these, two are the most prevalent, taught in schools and used by government officials, Hindi and English. Hindi and English, yes, sir! This is why, this is why every uh, Indian person 
can communicate with the whole world, basically. I, I don't know uh, if in China English is told in the schools, but I mean, English is spoken in the whole world and uh, within the country, probably most people talk Hindi, right? And if there's from another region someone, you talk English. This is how it works. All right. Often these two are like mixed mid sentence. It's weird. Don't be surprised if you hear someone speaking Hindi and then suddenly finishing off in English. It's like it's up to good super English verses. And I was like, this and I was like trying to like, why are you even trying to do that? I know, right? And the washing machine. I told them, but I said, give a Bob Saget with a chainsaw. Now, of course, let's discuss the one. I mean, this. <laughs> you know, you know, we have we have plenty of Turkish people in German, and this is how how they sound when they mix in Turkish with German. This is exactly the same pattern. In the washing machine, I told them, but I said, give a, a Bob Saget with a chainsaw. Now, of course, let's discuss the one thing that goes hand in hand with India, Hinduism. About 80% of India claims to be Hindu, or at least part of the Hindu practicing community. Now, we don't have time to explain everything about the tenets and multi-layered philosophies and practices of Hinduism. If you want to know, just talk to a Hindu person. But basically, one thing you do need to know is that Hindu-driven ideologies pretty much dominate most of life in India, everything from family to business. You will see colorful, mesmerizing shrines, temples, statues, and rituals being performed everywhere, even in public. On the Bharat Mata, the mother of India statues are everywhere. She's like the symbol of India. The largest Hindu pilgrimage, the Kumela, happens every three years, rotating between four cities in which the adherents bathe in the Ganges River and enjoy a massive festival with tens of millions of people. Like, tens of millions? You practically see it happening from space. Now, a controversial topic in- Boy, 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 boy. Chill, chill really quick. Chill really quick. What is this? What is this? It looks like livestock. All right, Hinduism? Hinduism is like the main religion in India and I guess he said 80% right? He said 80% like say they're involved in Hinduism or are Hindus. So we're actually talking about 1 million, uh, 1 billion people here, right? Pretty sure. All right with tens of millions of people like seriously you can practically see it happening from space now a controversial topic in relation to hinduism would be the caste system which is basically a belief that people are born into a socioeconomic life that they are destined to serve into today however the system is more fluid and loose from what it used to be from a long time ago and thanks to economic reforms anybody with enough drive can kind of move up the social ladder regardless of birth nonetheless india is home to every major religion in the world even a few jews including the benai menashe an indigenous group that claimed to be one of the lost tribes of israel in fact judaism and christianity actually had a head start in India way before it even kicked off in Europe. As tradition holds, Cochin or Malabar Jews migrated around 1000 BC to trade during the times of King Solomon and in 53 AD, Thomas the Apostle of Jesus arrived in what is now the state of Kerala to establish the first church in India. Today, most Christians are found in the southwest and far east Seven Sisters regions. India also holds the highest population of Sikhs, Jains and Zoroastrians. Okay, I want to I want to stop really quick. So we have we have all important religions in India plus like the minorities and one of one of them i see right on screen here it's the six and we talked about them because Muzafala was a Sikh himself and he he was from punjab and i mean I, i'm excited what he's saying about the minorities in here if you say like how they're how they're tr treated or anything that would be interesting to hear because he said for example there was a caste system like when you're from the bottom you stay at the bottom when you're on the top you stay at the top in in uh nowadays it's getting changed up a little bit but not like completely it's possible to to step up your game but okay 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 Let's see what he's saying telling about the religion here. And Far East Seven Sisters regions. India also holds the highest population of Sikhs, Jains, and Zoroastrians, mostly found in the north, and the second largest Muslim population in the world after Indonesia. Most Muslims are popular. Wait, wait, wait. This look, it's a Hind Hindu country, but it still has the second largest Muslim community in the world. After Indonesia. India is so huge, man. They have so many people. Mostly found in the north and the second largest Muslim population in the world after Indonesia. Most Muslims are populated around the northwest areas by Pakistan or in the east by Bangladesh. Of course, because both are Muslim countries, man. Oh, and don't forget the Buddhists. In fact, Buddhism actually started in India. Today, the Dalai Lama even takes refuge in Tespur in the state of Assam. Oh, that was a lot of information. Ah! Okay, so by now you can probably get a grasp of how incredibly mixed- Look, he's so going so fast on this. I've never heard him speaking so fast. He needs to finish this off in 20 minutes. You know what I'm saying? Oh boy. Hey, Buddhism. We know on Buddhism. This is interesting because I knew that from Nepal, but not from India yet. So it started, Buddhism kicked off in India. All right, that's how far we go.
state of Assam. Oh, that was a lot of information. Ah! Okay, so by now you can probably get a grasp of how incredibly mixed and diversified India's population is, but what exactly holds the country together? Well, for one, you kind of have to understand Indian history, which will take way too long to explain, but in the quickest way I can put it, Indus Valley, Maurya and Gupta empires, Southern empires, Golden Age, Middle Kingdoms, a ton of new religions come flocking in, the North fell to the Delhi Sultanate, the South became the Vijaya Nagara Empire, the Mughal Empire starts, British East India Company, direct British rule, nationalist movements, independence, republic, economic liberalization in 1991, and here we are today. <laughs> so we had, uh, the one thing I knew was the British colonization. So the other parts, I'm not familiar with the, the history of India, not at all. Nationalist movements, independence, republic, economic liberalization in 1991, and here we are today. <laughs> Vijaya. Essentially, India used to be made up of around... 500 smaller royal princely states and when the British came in they kind of exploited them to manage such a huge population Although India is a democratic federal republic and the largest democracy in the world The old royal families still exist today and although they have no political power They hold high positions of influence in their communities across India So today technically you could meet someone that would be considered an Indian prince or princess Nonetheless the biggest thing that really united Indians in the past two centuries would probably be their hatred of British rule It was kind of like yeah, okay, we, we going for the British hate, right? Because this seemed to be rooted deep because of colonization that they anger on 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 Br Britain, right? United Indians in the past two centuries would probably be so that was what united them. That was the initial question he had. Their hatred of British rule. It was kind of like, well, this is not cool. Yep. What do you say you and I work together in a end this thing? Essentially, one. Okay, so what united them was their fight against the Brit the Britons, right? good thing you could say that came out of imperialism was that it kind of stopped all the internal squabbling and unified the groups towards one common goal to get rid of imperialism today Indians are just proud to be Indian I mean a Tamil soccer player can get cheered on by a Rajasthani a Punjabi pop star can sell out tickets in Orissa speaking of which all Indians love movies and music India has the second largest film industry in terms of volume pumping out nearly 2,000 films per year surprisingly Nigeria pumps out more however wait what Wait, 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 what? That was just a joke, right? So we know about Bollywood, of course, everybody knows that, but... In terms of volume, pumping out nearly 2,000 films per year. Surprisingly, Nigeria pumps out more. However, the box office revenues gross out at only about $2 billion annually, compared to Hollywood at over $10 billion, but... So, one... Uh, wait, 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 wait. The box office revenues grossed out at only about two billion. What a what a box office revenues, man! Is this like what the actors earn? To Hollywood at over ten billion, but still, it's impressive. And keep in mind, it's not just Bollywood, but it's also Tollywood, Gollywood, Hollywood, Pollywood, and so on. There's like. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. I'm sorry if I if I said something wrong that I said Bollywood because this term we use usually. Telugu films is Tollywood. Gujarati films is Gollywood. Tamil films, Kollywood, Pollywood is Punjabi films, all right. 20 different woods in India. Oh, and like every movie in India has at least one scene where everybody breaks out in song and there's almost always a happy ending. Unfortunately, mainstream media has also put an aesthetic strain on many of the people as it's almost become an obsession to be light or fair skinned, causing people to go so far as to buy skin bleaching products. Some okay, this seems like, I mean, this is information he is saying now. This would be interesting from the side of India to discuss about like, is this really like a beauty ideal in India to have a lighter skin? Because I've never heard of that. Uh, Indians are, I mean, there are different, different um, regions, but we know there are Indians who are, who are more dark skinned. But I've never heard that this is like a bad thing for, for an Indian person, right? All right, that's interesting. An obsession to be light or fair skinned, causing people to go so far as to buy skin bleaching products. Some other controversies include things like illiteracy being an issue in many parts of the country, especially in the rural areas. But I mean, come on, when your country has literally hundreds of different writing systems, go figure. I mean, give them a break. Also, many of you. I mean, this is really, this is really to be hard. Like you, you grown up in a country where you basically, you, you're already learning growing up two languages. Actually, you need more, you need different scriptures, you need. There's too much happening in your own country that you can ever have been awareness of what's going on in your own country. It's j basically too much, man. You guys, the Indian geography peeps, have asked me to bring awareness to the fact that India does unfortunately have some of the highest rates of human trafficking and child slavery. Oh no. Okay. But, but this is actually, it says about India, it's one of the highest number, but we don't know about many countries, you know. This is the thing. 
And uh, there are no official numbers for many countries, I'm pretty sure. So child slavery, I think human trafficking, these things are in in very, very many countries are, are an issue. It's I think it's hard to say this is the uh, high number, one of the highest numbers in India, because maybe we just have the information for India. That's what I think. The government is trying to crack down and culture is slowly being reformed, but for now, it's a sad reality that still does exist. Hey, here at GN, we talk about the good and the bad. I'm just saying. Otherwise, sports do definitely tie everyone together as well, especially cricket, the national sport, even though they also used to do really well in field hockey. Hey man, this is really interesting because we had we had um, cricket bars in Krishna reactions and I was so confused. I was asking my, my viewers, why is there cricket? And cricket is actually the national sport in India, man. This is something, man. All right. And uh, golf, you said golf? Everyone together as well, especially cricket. The field sport, hockey. Even though they also used to do really well in field hockey. India also has a lot of their own indigenous sports like Dopkel in Assam, bull racing in Kerala, in Suknar, Ra bull racing, pushing in Mizoram, and Malakamba, this strange pole yoga gymnastics thing in the south. Otherwise, some notable people from India or of Indian descent might include people like Siddhartha Gautama or the Buddha, Mahavir, Ash Buddha, Shoka the Great, Prithviraj Chauhan, Aurangzeb, Shivaji of the Maratha Empire, Mohandas or Mahatma Gandhi. Oh, we know Gandhi, of course. Mahatma Gandhi is like one of the most famous persons in the world, right? Indira Gandhi, Subhash Chandra Bose, Jawahar Lal Nehru, Rabindranath Tagore, C.V. Raman, Satyendra Nath Bose, Bhagat Singh, Dr. A.P.J. Abdul Kalam, Shah Rukh Khan, Amitabh Bachchan, Amir Khan, Salman. Amir Khan. I've heard about Amir Khan. But look, that that was that was the thing because there's a, a singer in Pakistan called Imran Khan, and Imran Khan was a politician as well. So maybe they're just brothers in name, right? Okay. Khan, Priyana Chopra, Ben Kingsley, Sundar Pichai, Satya Narayana Nadella, A. R. Rahman, Sachin Tendulkar, and Mahendra Singh Dhoni. There's also literally millions of other famous people I missed out on. If you want to mention them, please, there's a comment section below. Use it. In the meantime, we gotta finish this info marathon, shall we? Hey Amen. It's really an info marathon. Holy cow, this is killing me. This is so much packed information in such a short time. We're only scratching the surface. You know what I'm saying? This is crazy. Friend zone. Now, no surprise, India is huge and therefore has a huge international outreach when it comes to diplomacy to almost everyone except their immediate neighbors. First of all, countries with large population percentages of Hindus and Indians like Fiji, Guyana, Suriname, Trinidad and Tobago, Mauritius and Malaysia typically stay close to India's roster of go-to friends. They enjoy cordial relations with trade. Now the UK may have left on a sour note, but they still have a lot of ties to their former colonizer in terms of business and tourism. So they don't like the Britons, but they still have... Look, I don't know even if that is a thing, that Indians think they don't like British people because does the world not like Germans just because of the World War II? I'm not sure about this, you know, there's... I don't know. India is still part of the Commonwealth, not Commonwealth realm, there's a difference. And the UK has over 1.5 million citizens of Indian descent. As mentioned in the China episode, China is kind of like India's I'm only here to do business with you and nothing else, friend. As <laughs> I mean, this is... We really talk a lot about China and India in the West, and I know that the Western media is really talking bad things about China, and India is not really like a favorite for, for our uh, news as well. So India is like a wild card in a way, so they don't like it's an animal or a friend, but it's nothing like really for for like Europe and especially and, and the United States. All right, and, and India and China themselves are not like having any friendship except from trading, right? Uh, I would I would actually consider this to be a, be a fact. I think that is actually true. As drama still hasn't subsided in regards to the territory conflicts. Now, when it comes to the U.S., things started kind of sour back in the 70s during the Indo-Pak War of 1971, when the U.S. sided with Pakistan, their arch nemesis. Today, relations have cooled off. Mostly, the U.S. supports India's move towards democracy and is a key ally in the military conflicts in the Middle East. When it uh, so the U.S. Americans want to have India as a partner. This is how how far I would go because as a key ally in the Middle East. So because there's so much, like we know they have problems with Iran, they have problems with they, Afghanistan, Iraq. So all these problems and India is like the key ally in this. After they actually were, there weren't like such a good connection because of Pakistan before, all right. When it comes to their best friends, however, most of the Indians I talked to have said Russia and Bhutan. Russia Bhutan, wait, 
This flag? I've seen Bhutan's flag just before. There was someone in the comments who, who wanted me to react to a song from Bhutan. And I didn't know the, uh, the flag. Okay, alright. Russia. Russia is a good friend of India. Sometimes I really wonder. Sometimes I really wonder because this is really weird. Look, Russia and China are trading very well as like there's so much in trading but they're not like the same the same uh, opinion about military things like now india and china like yeah i mean actually actually the same just just economics and no military like not anything working together now india likes russia amen these big countries they have so so weird things going on now they're, they're befriended with Russia and the United States. I'm, I'm confused. I talked to have said Russia and Bhutan. Russia because during the Indo-Pak wars, Russia came in and supported them. And ever since then, each country has held a high position of respect for the other, especially as global superpowers. So Russia assisted India in the Indo-Pakistan issue. The United States were on the other sides, right? They they teamed up with Pakistan. Why does some countries think they have to police the whole world? Boy. Bhutan and India signed a treaty of friendship almost immediately after independence. The two countries have shared interests and a currency pegged system as well. Bhutan even supported the annexation of their cousins in the Sikkim state into India as it gave a nice buffer of land from China's stake to their claim. In conclusion, you will not find anywhere else on earth like India. Thousands and millions of people inhabiting a colorful, majestic, green, slightly gritty at times slab of earth, blessed and cursed in so many ways, yet wonderfully harmonized, mostly in a unity unlike anywhere else. In I mean, this was this was the most weirdest sentence i've heard in a while man <laughs> it actually said nothing than anything man just diversity in the end that's india ah! stay tuned indonesia is coming up next indonesia all right so i want to i will keep it short right here because we had a really long reaction it uh, says over 40 minutes on my time uh, on my clock so i actually thank you for watching if you want to see more reactions like this please up to the channel and hit the bell and don't forget to hit me up on my socials especially instagram and facebook there you can recommend me videos songs write me messages give me feedback background knowledge and don't forget to check out one music video of myself because i'm a german rapper it's right here on screen it's provided with english subtitles you can understand the lyrics like that by reading while watching and right above you can find another reaction it's on geography now this was morocco that was might be interesting to you as well i wish you the very best stay healthy stay well and farewell